Okay. Welcome everybody to the stream today. Uh, we're going to be talking about a topic that I know a lot of people uh, want and are interested to hear in, and that's testing infrastructure as code with the cloud development kit for Terraform. So you've got infrastructure as code written in any of our programming languages supported by the CDK for Terraform. And now you want to use your language's testing tools to test the code. Well, that's what we're going to uh, cover today. And uh, before we go any further, obviously, there's some other people on screen with me. But before even that, we do need to uh, show our community guidelines here. So be welcoming, inclusive, friendly, and patient at all times. Be considerate and so on. They just don't be a troll. You know the spiel. And if you are curious as to what that entails, uh, be sure to check out the uh, link there. And that will clarify any questions. So before any further, I'm going to shut up here and let my guests introduce themselves. Let's go alphabetical order here. Damn. <laughs> First name or last name? OK. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Ansgar. Uh, I'm on the CDK for Terraform team, software engineer on the team. Uh, since a bit over two years, and uh, yeah, <laughs> any questions, drop them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer. What do you do on, on the team, Ansgar? Should you tell us? Yeah, I thought about that briefly, but the answer would be everything. Uh, so um, yeah, whatever comes up. Uh, I think my main focus um, was uh, mostly around the core package and the CLI. Um, but that's <laughs> that could be anything as well too. He does a lot more than he's building himself up to be to do, but that's that's fine. So we'll we'll, we'll move on and give you give you a break, Ansgar. <laughs> I agree. I, Ansgar does a lot. Um, he's awesome. Uh, so my name is Batahir. I think by far the hardest name to pronounce uh, in this panel. Um, so, um, but I don't mind. However, you say it, so I'm all good there. Um, I'm also an engineer on the team. I joined uh, less than a year ago, so I'm also the newest person on the team. So I'm kind of like learning the ropes as we go. Um, so if you see me during the during this whole thing, like com get something completely wrong and have Ansgar correct me, that's normal. That's how we we do it here. Um, and so before this, I was also um, working with uh, Terraform and infrastructure a little bit. So I have a little bit of context from a um, a, a user perspective of like how how difficult can things be and so on. So I'll be sort of introducing a little bit of the, that flavor as we go along. Mm, good, good flavor. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I had a joke there, but it's already escaped me. So um, what is the CDK for Terraform? For those of you who haven't heard of it yet, uh, this is our cloud development kit. And in essence, it allows you to write Terraform code in any of our supported programming languages, Python, Golang, TypeScript, Java, C Sharp. Am I missing any here? Those are the fantastic five, right? Yep, okay, so, right. And in essence, what it'll do is you'll write that code there, you'll be able to do the things you want, and then it'll compile down into Terraform, which will then be applied and go through the usual motions. And obviously, there's a lot of value in that for your teams if you want to stay in a particular programming language if you already have a lot of domain expertise in house around something that can take you a long way. However, there are some things inside that are implied by that, uh, many things, but the one we're gonna talk about today is testing. And so why is testing uh, important? Let's do that because I know that as software engineers, uh, Ansgar and um, Moody here, that's, it's very obvious, but if you've been just pure strictly in DevOps, strictly in ops, You've probably heard your engineers complain about it or, or like pedestal at one of the two. It's never in between. Um, but why, why is this important uh, specifically for the workflow that we have with the CDK? Um, so for, for a variety of reasons. So, so when you're dealing with code, there's a lot of like, um, uh, as opposed to like a, a configuration language, um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, which are slightly subtle, and then you don't want to wait for like, oh, the plan to run, and then find out like, oh, like things were kind of wrong. So uh, at CDK, I, I think we can do a lot more, and we'll continue to do a lot more in regards to testing. But I think already the tools we have in place kind of help you uh, in different stages of the product uh, of your project. So, and we'll touch on those things. But essentially. Uh, the things to remember for testing are like, am I am I doing the right thing? Is everything wired up the way that I want it to be? 
and um, is everything like sort of compliant? Is is everything happening the same way without kind of resorting to the whole? Do we need to roll it out to find out these things? So. Which can be a really funny way to spike your BPM, right? Yeah, <laughs> but maybe not sure. the best. Not the best way. But Ansgar, your take on this? Yeah, uh, I was about to say that it could be the opposite of spiking your BPM because having tests in general kind of reduces stress to me at least uh, because I can just change the thing and if all tests pass, it's usually fine. And the more tests and we have and the better they are, um, the easier uh, or the more robust the entire system gets. And I think that applies to infrastructure as well, not just to application code. So yeah, you can make changes and move faster without breaking things. Um, so to me, that uh, is, is the most the most value I, I see in testing, no matter which layer it's on. By the way, I meant for just the, the heart rate spiking was when you don't test and you just push it and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. agree. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, right. And there's going to be a couple, a few testing workflows we're going to look at here. So we're not just going to look at one type of testing you're going to be able to do. We're going to look at three different types of testing in context of the CDK for Terraform. And I do want to put out here that this is going to be in context of TypeScript, although you can use your testing tools and suites for the different languages we have supported. This will be in TypeScript land. So if you want conversation around what this might look like in other testing suites, you know, obviously just ask and uh, I'll field those questions. So let's talk about the project we're going to be working in context because we're going to we're going to demonstrate these tests, obviously, in a series of demos. But what is the project we're going to be doing these things in? Because one of the first things that we have to tackle here um, is obviously an environment to test in. Uh, and then also, you know, we'll, we'll touch on the fact that maybe you're not in the CDK. But um, let's go ahead and start start on the project. Did you want to describe that, Ansgar and Muda here? Do you want me to share your screen to, to, to show that? I think I can give a, like a super brief intro. So should um, I show the should I show Ansgar's screen? Yeah. Yeah, my thanks. Yes. All right. Here we go. Um, go for it. So yeah. So for this uh, for this demo, we wanted to keep it really uh, simple, and we wanted to focus on the things we want to focus on. So we're not throwing everything that you can build with CDKTF here. Uh, the goal is just to kind of like have a very simple scenario to go walk through. So it's a very contrived example. Uh, it is AWS based. It is uh, setting up a uh, ECS cluster uh, using Fargate, and then also um, um, doing a little bit of like conversion and so on that we go that we'll go through, and then and then we'll start testing all, some of these things. Um, but yeah, so it's it's super simple, easy to get to. You can visit the uh, the repo in the end uh, once you make that public, and then um, yeah, learn about how um, you know we we do these kind of like testing things on that that scenario specifically. Anything to add to that, Anscar? No. No? <laughs> OK, gotcha. That works up. So it's straightforward enough. Um, yeah, and we'll obviously have all of these, the, the Git repos for this demo code live up. And we'll have those in the description below if they're not already, if it's not already in the description. I don't think it is, but we'll make sure that we uh, get that there. But um, the way we're going to walk uh, through it, bird's eye view, right? We're going to do, we're going to touch on the conversion, right, of HCL to CDK for Terraform, just in case you want to you want to try this and you have something existing. Then we're going to talk about some of the phases of this that the CDK for Terraform goes through, so that everyone understands how it's working. This is going to be important for testing. We're going to go into unit testing, uh, unit testing logic, uh, and, well, unit testing logic and compliance. This is where commas and my agenda here would be helpful, but uh, it's too late now. <laughs> then we'll do integration testing and resource relationships, and then uh, cap it off in our last uh, demo here, which will be with snapshot testing and safeguarding uh, changes. So if you're if you're curious to what each of those different types are, obviously we will get uh, we'll, we'll get to those. But the first things first. Let's say that you have a, a some existing code inside of. Um, inside in HCL and you want to try out the CDK for Terraform. What tools do we have? What processes can we use to convert your HCL project to the CDK for Terraform? So let's hop in uh, to this. Uh, who's let, Ansgar. So let's start with just sort of the technical steps. How do you go about doing this? Give me like a simple example. If you, well, I know that what your example is, so I'm acting like I don't know what it is, but surprise me. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, surprise you or not. Um, 
So uh, the CDK from Terraform does have a command that's, that's called uh, convert. Uh, and it takes uh, an input that is um, HCL, and the output will be CDK for Terraform config uh, or code, if you want, in any of our languages. And um, what we did prepare for this is a short command that looks a bit more complicated because it um, writes this to a new file instead of just outputting it. Uh, but at the gist, um, you run CDKTF convert. Um, and pipe some um, Terraform code to it and select the language and pass um, the provider that it's using. That is so it can use the um, exact version of the provider to then um, generate the bindings. And in this example, we are starting or basing off of an ECS uh, service. So we do have some Terraform config uh, not CDK, but HCL, so in the Terraform configuration language, um, that we start off of, um, which is a tiny piece that we kind of kept uh, in our, uh, didn't convert yet to the CDKTF version of this, but rather kept um, as an example of how to use convert. And um, now that this uh, command here finished, um, we can we wrote to the client ECS service.ts file, which is a new file we can see over here. And that now contains some code that um, has some squiggly lines to it. And uh, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but the reason in short is that our um, Terraform file uh, also has some uh, references to other, um, for example, outputs or other resources. Uh, that are not present in this uh, scope. So we converted an incomplete example of Terraform, uh, but it still produced something um, that is like the equivalent there. So, um, and I can get into that in a bit, but I suppose you might have some questions uh, on convert. Oh, just to provide a little bit of additional uh, context here as well, like convert is, an, is a really interesting command because it takes in HCL and then spits out like what the languages that CDK supports. Uh, so that in itself is really cool. Uh, when I first encountered it, I was like really uh, pleasantly surprised that we have a, a workflow already. Uh, but in the last um, uh, release, as well as as uh, in the in the future release, we're, we continue to improve this because we feel like this is also a really good way to start uh, understanding how uh, CDKTF uh, could be written, uh, especially if you're coming from an ACL uh, background. Um, in this example, uh, specifically, what's interesting to note is that we already have a CDKTF project that will, like, for the most part, synthesize and everything, and, and you can deploy all of this. Uh, but you might have some, for example, some code that you have in HCL, or you're moving your entire code base over piece by piece. So this example is really good in that regard. It sets up that, that um, scenario where you have a little bit of uh, HCL that you want to bring over to CDK, uh, which could be your, like, your destination um, uh, repository, for example. Uh, and you'll, you'll encounter some of these like problems there where you say, like, oh, that was not referenced properly, or this is where depending on a different part of the project for this thing. And what we'll do here is we'll, we'll try to go through all of these kind of problems and and take the converted output and clean it up and not get worried about like oh there's so many problems in this and it's kind of broken it it has it doesn't have all the context so it does its best but it's really easy to also kind of give that it give it that context and um, uh, and fix it and one of the other things that Ansgar is also going to uh, be doing here is like kind of showing how you should um, best practices kind of create things like for example the config you want to pass into this construct. Uh, because it is creating a construct, uh, convert can also create a stack, but that's another for another time. But uh, for the most part, we're going to also be showing like how best practices work in this regard. Yeah, awesome. So real quick before we go any further, Ansgar, I'm going to need you to bump that font size up. Give me like one or two pinches here. Maybe you yeah, can get the first. See how that how that works here. Just just you know. So I'm so trying. Okay. But something is capturing the keys. Is uh can can we bump the terminal size up just a tad a bit as well? All right. Oh no, the ah. terminal takes focus, but uh, I couldn't ah, do there that. There we go. That looks that looks better. Yeah. That all that all bumped right. it up. Yeah. Okay. So just for just for the like and thanks, uh, Moody here for that the the, the uh, context there. Um, so just to sort of like summarize where we are, we had a Terraform file. 
We threw it through this command. And could you pull the terminal up a little bit? Just actually, I guess I could get rid of this. I just got right. rid of the little the little bumper there, but I have that up there so people know uh, where we are if they join. But we've got a Terraform file. You're gonna pipe it through to this command, cdktf convert. You're gonna pick your language. You're gonna reference a particular provider and it is going to output some TypeScript, some CDK Terraform TypeScript. Granted, that's because we selected that. And the thing to keep in mind is that based on your language, it's not gonna necessarily have all the context. One of the things to point out here, if you are a Terraform junkie, user, I guess I could have used a better term there. Um, you're used to your files in that flat file structure in your directory having context of every other file, right? That's why you, like, you can just reference, say, in this Terraform module.client.task definition ARN because that's in some other file. But in TypeScript, we know that we need to import that stuff, right? We need to pass those in. And that is a lot of what the red you see here. So you're going to have to resolve some of these things for your lang uh, language uh, as is and I think that was that was part of what uh, what was being touched on. Okay, so let's move on. We got the TypeScript. Show us how we can how we can break this down. Although you know, uh, obviously we, we're gonna not go into every aspect of this because we really want to talk about testing. Uh, so if you do have any extended questions on this, folks, we can obviously get together with you, uh, um, at, you know, outside of the stream. So as you as you were in, Scar, apologies. Yeah, no worries. It's, it's a nice segue into what I was going to do. So. Uh, of course, uh, to save some time, I prepared the config that we are going to go after. So these are all the uh, things that are dependencies that are um, or that need to be explicit. Um, so we are actually going to start uh, passing uh, a config uh, to our construct because we want to configure this uh, from the outside. Uh, I removed this import um, and talk about this in a bit because we ought to do have um, AWS ECS service, um, so the actual resource reference in here. And um, if we import this directly uh, from our Freebird provider instead, um, which we have installed in this project, um, and import it from the lib directory, that's something where you can, if your sim times are slow, um, really notch up the performance quite a bit um, because it will only import a bit. So that's like a sidetrack. Um, of one of the things to do, and um, because that really helps out. And now I would go ahead and add like the cluster arm. Um, so kind of replace everything uh, that I have in here with stuff that comes from my uh, config. So um, target group arm. Um, then we do have some uh, string uh, concatenation where in uh, JavaScript, I can also uh, just do this or like do a uh, template string uh, to kind of include all the bits uh, that we have. Uh, this is the security group ID. Um, this can go away and that's going to be the subnet. And we are almost done. Uh, this is going to be the task definition. Um, so now we replaced um all the bits everything works now at least no more squiggly lines uh, i cannot re rename this because this is not my converted code but our client ecs service um, and i can also export it so i can use it in different classes um, beautiful beautiful it's not my converter class it's your converter yeah. class, right <laughs> um so I'm going to hear thoughts on the process there, if you'd like to, if you had any. Yeah, uh, I think there's a couple of things here which are really interesting. The first thing that Ansgar called out, which was a really valuable, if you are dealing with larger CDKTF projects and you have, and you're using like providers, which are sort of big, like for example, AWS provider is, is really huge. Uh, and you're seeing like, oh, CDK is taking a long time to save. Uh, you're probably just importing all of the AWS resources and data sources into the main uh, in, into your project, and that kind of takes time for TypeScript to process or any other language, for example. Um, so using this new um, import syntax, where you like you really go into the resource that you want to import, uh, and and thankfully uh, VS Code and and if you've got a compatible editor, like they will auto complete it for you, auto import it for you. So that kind of stuff is really really valuable to take note of. Um, 
the, the second thing also here is, um, so we, we, we already knew what we were doing, so we kind of pasted in the interface. And so that kind of seems like magic a little bit, and you won't be able to do that uh, as such. But uh, you'll have to kind of like look at, into uh, the kind of things that this this whole piece needs. And so uh, you can ask for, like, if you have other resources that you want to reference here, just put them in your config. Once you made that interface, it's really easy to update. You just add another field in there and reference that field wherever you need to. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, of, of obviously, like export and all of that kind of also is useful for uh, if you're coming in from like a, a TypeScript um, background where you understand like, oh, this this component or this construct needs to be used elsewhere. So we need to export it out of this uh, file. Um, so in general, like we we kind of like went through it pretty fast, but you might have a little bit more time on this. Uh, but essentially, you're doing the same thing, right? You're, just, you're basically taking in stuff that is existing on your other on your project elsewhere and bringing in and bringing that in as a config. And we definitely definitely recommend using an interface and a config uh, to pass that in. You can also do it on a positional arguments basis. That kind of gets really old really fast. You've got like you you've got these specific things happening. So now this with this kind of um, process, you have everything named and it's on. Like you can uh, update this as or use it as you wish and, and change it as you wish as well. Awesome. So, uh, real quick, um, I had some questions like, you know, around the general asks around the CDK for Terraform on both YouTube and LinkedIn. I pasted a link to talk that goes through what it is and the, and the basics. I promise it was not a shameless plug. I just happen to be the person that gives the talk. Um, but for people that that are like, this is complete gobbledygook to me because I'm not a TypeScript. Um, can you real quick, Ansgar, can you do the code collapse for line 15 just so we can uh, in VS Code, just, just so we can like focus in. I mean, code collapse the interface real quick too, just so we can really simplify it. Uh, just code collapse both here. So if you're just in Terraform, what you're looking at here, right, is this file, what it's doing is, when you use this class and create an object from it, which hopefully we have a little bit idea of object orient orientation. When you use this class, it's gonna create the resources within it. That's all that's going on here, right? So it's almost like its own file. And this interface is just kind of like some guidelines about what needs to be passed into this objects created from this class in order for it to do what it is that it needs to do. And we have the beauty of type safety here, where if you now expand uh, line six for us in SCAR, uh, it's saying, hey, your cluster has got to be a string. The project has got to be a string, right? So you get that nice type safety there. And then, of course, you get all of the nice autocomplete stuff if you're in VS Code. But, um, right, let's go ahead just for time because we got to get on to uh, testing. This is basically setting us up to start. Uh, it, you, you probably already have this if you're working on the CDK for Terraform, but this is just if you want to convert from HTML to CDK TF. But the leap we're going to have to take a bit here is if you're making that choice, we do have to assume to some extent that you know the language that you're converting to. Otherwise, I mean, I guess you just like pain. <laughs> but uh, so, so we are going to assume that you know this to some extent. But for those of you, uh, it, it, even if you're familiar with any programming language, it should be uh, relatively um, familiar. OK, so let's go into our next topic here. And this is talking on um, synthing, right? And this is something that you need to understand for the different types of tests that we have. So let me go ahead and, and switch our thing here. Um, well, I'm gonna not even try to sum this up right here. I'm gonna let this just go straight to, uh, to, to Muda here and Ansgar. What is CDKTF synthing? Yeah, so um, synthesizing, or oh, maybe Muta here you can uh, start. So I can uh, actually include the code that we just added. Uh, I think bringing yeah. back the code, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so as as Ansgar wires this thing up into our actual stack where we can use this new uh, construct, I'll I'll try to explain the concept of a CDK yeah. TF synth and why it's even required. Like if you're coming in from like a Terraform background, you're like, oh, I plan and apply, and that's uh, that's about it. It should just work, and um, um, it does similarly for a CDK TF as well. But we are dealing with because we are. Uh, we are using Terraform, and we have to generate the ETL uh, for Terraform to use. We have to have this additional step where we compile all of this code, and so it spits out the ETL JSON that can be used by um, Terraform. And so uh, that is, in in essence, basically synth. And it, 
It works across all languages. It takes whatever language you have written your code in and then just kind of makes it into a format that Terraform can understand, uh, essentially. Um, so yeah, in, in a really broad uh, sense, you go from code to um, Terraform in using Synth. Beautiful. I think that's a good nutshell. So in this, though, we're going to have two more terms that we that we uh, use, pre-synth and post-synth. Now, obviously, there's some like, kind of obvious based on what they're called, but what do people need to know about those before we get into our first testing type here? Yeah. So uh, as I as I said before, uh, um, synth converts code to from code to um, Terraform at uh, ACL JSON. Um, the thing to note here is pre-synth and post-synth are really valuable to understand uh, from a testing perspective. So you want to be able to uh, to have the option of testing certain things in your language. So for example, like I'm having, do I have the right logic? For example, have I kind of done things in the right way? Is it is it just working the way I expect it to? Um, that's kind of all that works in pre-synth. So before uh, CDKTF converts it into ACL JSON. And then there's post-synth. It's like, oh, what it actually did it generate? Like, can I make sure that um, whatever I think it's generating is the thing it's generating? So that roughly, if you have that model in your head, you can write a bit, bit more effective tests there uh, of like, uh, this is what I test before synthesization, and this is after synthesization. That's a hard word for me to pronounce. Nice. Yeah. So I think that's pretty good. Synthesis overall, we convert your language to Terraform compliant JSON. Pre-synth before we do it, post-synth after we do it. And after and the, the reason here is this is gonna have context for the test that we're gonna be writing. And in the in the um, terminal here, Ansgar, can you oh like make it a little bit bigger just just for for now? Uh, yeah, just expand it upward so they can see. Yeah. Um Ansgar's run the synth command so that you can see what that looks like. Okay, so let's go ahead and step into our first section here, and that's going to be unit testing. Uh, and we're going to actually stick on this file. But uh, what is, uh, for both of you all, the context of in terms of business value, uh, engineering value of unit tests, for those who don't know? I to Do you want to take a lead on this one? Or <laughs> should I? Um, so with, with unit testing, um, we're definitely trying to uh, test a very specific part of your code. Um, so that's kind of roughly what unit testing means is like there is a small part of your code base that you want to make sure that it's getting the right uh, inputs and it responds the right way to, to, uh, to those inputs. Um, for, um, for compliance and so on, we kind of have, because we're dealing with the infrastructure, we have that um, ability to make sure that am I passing in the right things? Are these the things that are required? And, and, and all of that kind of that flows from a very domain specific infrastructure um, background uh, in that regard. So, so in this case, unit, unit testing logic and compliance is like testing the smallest piece of your infrastructure. Nice. And score anything to add yes. for that? Can we <laughs> see, the, see the stuff? That was perfect. No, nothing to add. All right, Stuffy. cool. So we're going to do just that to this file that we have just converted, correct? Yeah, although the test does live in a different file. Uh, yep. But I'll pull this down a bit. Um, oh so the only so I added this uh, while um, Jihye was talking about synthesizing. Um, so this is now using the construct that we added. Um, this is also. Um, similar to what we're going to test. So we do have a main test GS file. It still has like some uh, examples in there. So we do have this uh, reference. Uh, so when you create a new CDKTF project, um, this will be already part of it. So it's nice to look at it, especially if you're using other languages as we are now looking at TypeScript, uh, but you might be using a different language. So um, look at the examples you might find there. And of course, I already prepared something because I'm a very slow typer. Um, and I'm going to use uh, uh, like the auto completion to import things. Um, so, in, in this case, and as Cole mentioned, unit tests, uh, we're testing, a, or Ruti here mentioned, we're testing a very small uh, piece of our infrastructure or of our code. 
Um, we are only instantiating uh, the client ECS service. Um, so uh, in our case, that's our new construct that we just created. And we are passing lots of dummy values in there. So uh, because for testing, we don't really care. We just want to use them uh, to be able to figure out whether the right thing was passed. And one thing to note, um, you'll see that the service has some kind of error to it. And that is because um, our client service construct creates an ECS service resource. So that's the actual Terraform resource that you might know uh, from the AWS Terraform provider. And this one is just hidden inside it. So we kind of need to make it available. And this is what we do by um, exposing this first and declaring the property. Um, so now um, in the test case, um, it can access this ECS service um, instance. And um, there's also a way to access whatever we pass as an input uh, to the task definition. Um, and in our case, we wanted to, the client task definition on and uh, to be passed to our service as the task definition input. So if you look at the code, um, we are having the config and we are having the task definition. And um, this is coming out of the client task definition. On. So we kind of know that we are doing the right thing already. So hopefully uh, this test works. Um, so we can run, um, I think it's inside of Yarn, Yarn test watch. Um, so we have this test script, uh, which is already part um, of the CDKTF um, base project or whatever you start with. And uh, we can see that this test passed. So uh, it does actually work. Uh, would you hear do you want to add something to that? Break, break, yeah, break I want the to test have, real quick. Oh, sorry. Real quick, break the test so that we can see. Oh, sure. I can yeah, break there, everything. Yeah. Let's just do arm two. <laughs> <laughs> it fails. Ah, and see. it tells us that, oh, maybe pull it up a little, but uh, it tells us that it's the wrong thing now. Yeah. Can, we can you do me a favor yeah. and instead of breaking the test, go break the code so that the test yeah. fails? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that's the easiest way to break it, but. Uh, instead of passing the task definition on, I could accidentally have passed the client security group ID. So if I pass this, um, the output uh, will actually make a bit more sense because you might see like, oh, the expected yes. thing is something completely different. So that's the real real world case there. Beautiful. All right. Sorry, Anskar, as you were going to say. No worries. Or mute here. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, asking. No, so... so there's a couple of things here that are really interesting if you're coming in from a um, uh, using, uh, for example, even Terraform or coming in from like an infrastructure standpoint where Anskar just casually said, you, we'll just put in some dummy values and we're going to test it, right? And doing that in other places is is really hard still, right? So you won't be able to have the chance of just saying, oh, I'll just, I'll, I won't really wire this up and I'll just test this thing if it, if it works. And uh, but here with CDKTF, because we're using uh, these high-level languages that have like really advanced testing uh, frameworks already in place, we can sort of like take this small piece and say like, oh, we just want to make sure we are doing what we expect. And and it, it's even more so. It, it might seem silly that we just wrote this code and we're writing the test for it, but um, as you go on and as your project matures over time, we've seen as software engineers that like things can get broken over time. People come in that don't have the full context of why you did certain things. And so writing that thing that thing down here right now allows you to safeguard that work uh, much later down the line, right? So so like for things like regressions and so on. So that that part is really valuable here. And this is why unit tests are A, super powerful to use in your CDKTF project. And also like they provide you a lot of um, value for, for the time you're spending to write them. So in our opinion, always definitely try to have unit tests for everything. Make sure that you're you're doing the same thing you're expecting to do. It might seem silly at, at, at this time, but over over uh, time, you learn to appreciate that you have this suite of tests that make sure that everything is going the way that you want it to. Yeah. And uh, real quick, because I want to give sort of a devops -y thought on that. Um, for those of you, uh, we, there's some like technical stuff here. So if you're coming straight from Terraform, and you're looking at, say, the expect client.service.dot 
task definition input, you may be looking for the, the straight attribute that gets that gets that generally gets referenced in normal HCL. Um, however, in context of the CDK for Terraform and specifically for these, these tests that happened before synthesis, uh, Ansgar and Muda here, can you give us sort of our nutshell thing to think about it? I know the rule of thumb is just use input there to grab <laughs> the thing, but you know. Yeah, actually that is the difference between pre and post sin to some degree um, because we, so in CDKTF, um, you might pass a value to a construct, and that will later on end um, in uh, the Terraform config, or the config that we generate, the Terraform instance. And um, if you reference a different resource in Terraform, um, the value might actually be different. Uh, because, for example, if I reference um, dot arm of an S3 bucket, that might be a value that I, in theory, could know beforehand, but that will only be known after I apply and more so for IDs and other um, attributes. And um, this is similar here, kind of, as in the task definition input is the exact value that you pass to the uh, ECS service construct to the resource, um, whereas the, if we would access dot task definition, we would get a reference, which is something where CDKTF tells us this is the actual value Terraform will know when it runs, uh, but we aren't able to know that yet um, because um, this is all pre-sync uh, when, um, when the user code runs at this point. So um, yeah, for a pre-sync test, use input. So that was right, yeah. Yeah, which is is something that, that you, you'll you encounter in normal Terraform whether you know it or not. If you're using something like Sentinel, right? We can't, we can't, and you you encounter this and other things in the graph as well. If you're working with normal Terraform in terms of not knowing values uh, beforehand, and this is just a case of that because we obviously haven't applied it, so we can't possibly know it. So we need to take exactly what's there. Rule of thumb: If you're doing unit tests, use the attribute Campbell case input or underscore input, I think perhaps in some of the other languages. But um, something I want to wrap up here before we move move on here, just for the direct real world use case, right? Say you've got all these services that have, the reason why we have compliance here that have required attributes. Like let's say that there's certain amounts of, of CPU and memory, or perhaps there's certain tags that need to be on all of these, right? Or perhaps you have a certain naming scheme or any of these different types of things. This is where unit tests are absolutely going to help you with compliance. Because obviously it's going to safeguard you against some rogue engineer like uh, Daniel Schmidt, who's not on here with us today, coming in and just being like, ah, I'm going to just do whatever I want naming wise and just wrecking stuff. Like that's obviously part of it. But the other side of it is you can have your other various teams that need policy enforced to come in and say, we need these things and all of these resources. You can write unit tests here and make sure uh, that that happens. But I believe, does that take us on to the third type of testing? Uh, I think the second, right? Or, uh, so, or sorry, the second. Just had one. <laughs> That's one of the first <laughs> Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, it does. Okay, great. So, uh, right, the mood of here. Anything else that I miss before we go? No, just just like the the compliance part is absolutely right. Like because you're using um, normal code, you can just kind of throw and say like, oh, I didn't get this thing, and you can write a test that captures that throw. Is like, oh, I used. The maximum, if you're using EC2, I'm using the biggest uh, EC2 instance that is available on AWS and passing that in uh, into my service. And as an uh, as somebody, or maybe as an org, you go like, oh, do not allow that to happen in your code. So you can just kind of throw on that and you can write a test to make sure that you throw on these things or things like tags and so on. So there's a lot of like flexibility here that you can leverage uh, using these tests to make sure that all the code that is supposed to be caught gets caught early on and you have a test to prove it. Yummy. And of course, if this is just in TypeScript, but you can do this with any, when he, with, bleh, with any of the other languages testing suites. And that's just unit tests. So let's go and move on to what we call integration testing uh, and how this helps with resource relationships. This is our second type. And so uh, to get in this, get, uh, well, the two of you, and when in doubt, just go alphabetical order, first name, uh, Ansgar, uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of of the value of this type of testing here. Yeah, should I uh, start with the content uh, with the- Oh, the no, no, let's, do, let's go quick nutshell high level so we know yeah. what we're getting into and uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, 
compared to unit tests, which test a small piece uh, in isolation, as we've seen before, we kind of plugged in all the bits. Uh, for integration tests, we want to test the larger system, whether it integrates and whether the different units integrate the way we expect them to integrate. So what this means uh, for our um, infrastructure projects is that we not only test whether a single value has the right thing, but we rather test whether um, two components are connected uh, in, in the right way. And um, for this, um, I now am allowed to put in some code. Um, Wait, let would, me, let's get, yeah, let's oh, get. Oh, no, I'm not. Yeah, yeah let's get, <laughs> let's get Mary here's uh, perspective on this oh, just sorry. real quick. Yeah. Yeah, so so in the in the test that we currently had, we just kind of like tested like, oh, this is our big piece. But eventually at the end, we all saw that it's creating a bunch of resources and it's creating and it's like sort of passing in parameters and so on. So on a on a more construct level where you have like maybe a um, a part of your system, not the whole system, but a small part of your system, and you want to make sure that I'm I'm kind of within this thing, I'm wiring things right. So for that kind of things, the following test is really useful uh, to use, and it's it's a nice model uh, that allows you to, if you if you understand how this is working, it will allow you to kind of test all of these internal wiring things without going into the full blown scope of like oh I need everything, but at the at the same time kind of getting it to uh, some of the post send stuff is like um, are we are we like eventually creating the right uh, thing? Are we eventually creating the right resources? Are they having the right values and so on? So uh, this test is kind of like getting you to that part of like, um, as we talked about uh, ha uh, high blood pressure and, and BPM and so on, this is gonna resolve that part of the, the high blood pressure that you'll have eventually. Out here saving hearts. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> let's go. Let's get into the uh, the technical steps here for setting up the integration test. Tell us, first up, before you throw in the code, Ansgar, tell us like what it is that, that we're testing. What's the problem that we're like, we need to make sure this is this is sound. Yeah, so for this time around, we are not um, constructing or creating or using a single construct or single small bit that creates only a few resources, but we are rather throwing in everything, which means uh, we do have our stack, which is uh, the entry point for CDKTF um, project or Terraform project, is, or like Terraform root module would be the correct term. Um, that's the equivalent there. Um, and we are using our entire application, if you want. And um, as we are only having one stack in this project. Um, so we will create uh, our own our stack and then look at two uh, resources that we have in there. And one is um, the uh, task definition that we uh, create, um, or one of them. And the other thing is going to be um, our monitoring role. So we do have an IAM policy um, or IAM role to be more correct. And um, that one is intended to give permissions for the task monitoring. And um, we want to check whether um, the task definition that we do have actually gets this role uh, assigned uh, or a reference to that resource. Um, so to um, that very um, address IM role that we're creating. Um, mm. So we're kind of looking at the two bits uh, left and right and checking um, whether um, that one is actually used there. I, I feel like Cole, I've, I feel Cole that you put us in this memory game in this situation. And that I feel like there's the test we're going to talk about is slightly different, but I, I could also be wrong because I have, I have horrible memory. So let's go in like, I, I think I'd like to see the code first and then discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, this is the code that I talked about. Um, so I will make the terminal a bit smaller. And cool. I, I definitely got it wrong then. Uh... Yeah, no, <laughs> no worries. Um, no. Uh, so, oh no, we, we have the same, same thing again. So there's some stack. Uh, we have our main TS file. And it is uh, just like in here. So we got to export it. Uh, but that was intended. So I can import it here. And the same um, is for the ECS task definition client, which is another construct or building block um, that we already had in place. Um, so we're going to use that one as well. So real um, quick, just so I can yeah. throw this out there for my just pure Terraform users. Yes. This 
what's having to happen since we are doing a test that's testing relationships is we are taking the entirety, more or less, of our CK for Terraform code and we're synthing it down. We're munching it down to just get everything, quote unquote, built. It's not obviously not built or live, but to what's eventually going to be built. This is going to be that Terraform compliant JSON. Right? It's going to then take this, turn it into the JSON output, and this is going to let us test the stuff after the fact, after it's been munched down so that we can ensure that what's been built is there. And what we're going to test specifically is that the relationship that we want to have between a task definition and an IAM role are uh, indeed uh, together, right? Yes. Sweet. Okay, cool. Yeah. And... Um... This is also more into the deep uh, TypeScript end of things with CDKTF. Um, but we do need to figure out uh, the ID of our resource. We know that it's called client task definition. Um, but we also um, have some uh, identifier to it, um, which has reasons because you can construct the same construct side by side. And then you would essentially uh, could, well, you could get a conflict. Um, so this is why we're accessing our task definition uh, resource and then using that ID in here uh, to kind of find the right thing in the JSON. If you want, I could show um, what the JSON uh, output looks like uh, to be a bit more relatable because this is all uh, abstract and uh, our cdktf.out sure. directory, which is where the result of cdktf synth gets written into, Incidentally, it contains the same thing because we are also using the stack in there. So we do have the CDKTF JSON, and that one has a task definition. And then we are having uh, this kind of ID uh, that's to it. And that's the one that we kind of need to uh, figure out because we'll then look into the execution role arm, um, which hopefully has the task monitoring role in it, uh, which we can already see a bit uh, that's in there. Um, so we are kind of um checking the json uh, whether there is an object and that has the execution role arm you can see here it has those um underlines because we're in our uh, snake case uh, format because we're now working in um, terraform land and um, terraform post synth has uh underlines or snake case if you want um to the attribute names um, so that's where that is coming from. And um, yeah, I pass, uh, pasted the test and it did pass. So uh, can you make that screen bigger so we can see it? Oh, yeah, sure. The, the test there. Yeah, so awesome. this is the bottom most one. You can also awesome. run it so we can see synchronized output instead. Can you also show me what this would? safeguard against or check so like uh if you don't break the test but break the thing that's testing for us yes um so as i said um we are looking whether the task monitoring uh role is um the one resource that we're using in there so if i go to the ecs task definition um we can see um that we are passing the execution role arm from uh, whatever is passed to it. Um, so if I jump somewhere where I'm creating this task definition and I now need to kind of find the right one, uh, which is for the service, because we have multiple, uh, or for the client, sorry, the task definition client. And this is passing the monitoring IAM role on. Um, and if I would now um, pass a different role, and I don't even know whether we have some other IAM role, incidentally, in here? No. But um, if I would accidentally uh, pass the different arm of some role in here, um, we could see that um, the value that ends up in uh, Terraform will actually be wrong. And it tells us that it was looking for the string that has this reference in here, uh, but it got this result, and if we see look at the execution rule arm, we will see that there's something else in there. Um, so we can kind of inspect what's going on there. Yummy. Yes. Good to hear. Enlighten us with your thoughts. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so first of all, like I, I feel like this this test itself is a little bit hard, even even for me. So, I, I would like to kind of step through it a little bit uh, to to like explain it uh, as to what's happening. Um, a couple of things that we we are doing here is like we're running the full synth here within the test, which itself is really awesome that we can do that right within a test. So, so we get all the synth, and then we get the output that would otherwise kind of live in a file somewhere. So we get this file, uh, this output JSON uh, in our test, and then we parse it back into something that JavaScript, for example, or TypeScript can understand. Um, Obviously, this will vary from language to language, but there's JSON uh, parsing tools almost in every single language, being such a popular thing. Um, then, in between lines 31 and 32, if, if you can see, like we're doing a little bit more technical work here, where we're saying, like, oh, we know that the stack contains a child called client task definition, uh, and once we have that resource um, or, or construct, we will. Uh, look up the ID for that, that CDKTF has generated by itself. So we don't know that thing uh, at the time of testing what that ID will be. Even CDKTF doesn't know these are not hard coded. So it's really important to kind of look that up. And CDKTF provides these uh, kind of utilities like friendly unique ID to reference that within your tests. Uh, so knowing this thing is, is kind of like having a, a really um, useful superpower of like figuring out where everything is in your tests. Um, moving forward, we kind of know, like, we can take a look at, as, as Ansgar showed, like, we take a look at our uh, output JSON and see, like, oh, there's this resource dot AWS task definition. Uh, and that kind of, like, as you pass in the ID to it, um, you already can now operate within that inside and then say things like, oh, for example, we did object containing. We could do uh, arrays having or uh, arrays containing, and then even string matching, it can be possible. And so you now are working with a simple plain object that you can kind of dissect and, and ensure uh, various things on. Um, and, and some of these things can be made easier by snapshot tests. We'll talk about that later. Um, but to come back to why we kind of have these kind of tests, uh, it's really important what this test kind of ensures for us is like, oh, for, for the service that we have, are we assigning it the right role? Like, because that is really important uh, as you go along, um, where like you've got thousands of services or you've got like so many roles that you don't know where everything is, but you want to make sure that, for example, service A has role for service A uh, and not for service B, for example, um, that we weren't able to show, but but that's kind of the the aspect of this, and so. We're going really deep down on stuff that is being synthesized, so whatever Terraform is going to work on, and then saying, like, oh, the relationship between that resource there near the top, for example, of your JSON file, and this service here at the bottom of it, they both match. And, and, and that will not change over time. So this test kind of protects you from that kind of problems that are coming up. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that is very key, because the other otherwise with the unit tests, again, it's isolated. This is going to take everything into consideration. And I just want to point out for my Terraform people here, like this is probably some of what you've wanted to do in the sense that it's just kind of clicked at me as we here as we're talking. That the real difference is between the post synth, right? And the pre synth is like this aspect here, you're getting the opportunity to test the finalized Terraform compliant JSON before we pipe it through to actual Terraform. You know, it's got all those relationships built in. Um, and then, of course, all the other great stuff Ansgar and Moody here have touched on. Okay, but there is one last area we wanted to cover, the third type of test, because we are, are here wrapping up integration testing and resource relationships in the sense that you're getting to test more of an integrated experience of your entire code base because it's all together and munched down. But are there any other last thoughts here? No? Okay, great. So let's go ahead and get into the third type of testing. And this one, unless Jess has expanded its its reach to the different languages, is going to be more TypeScript specific, right? Am I missing something or did Jess go to the other languages? Mm -hmm. Not that I know. Okay, um... gotcha. <laughs> so um, at least, so for snapshot testing, uh, it's been... It's been a uh, year since I've done front end, but I, I, I originally fell in love with it because it was designed to take out the weight and the time that was otherwise going into unit testing because there was so many tests you write and snapshot was there to like make it a lot faster. But I would like to hear the context and the value of snapshot testing from, from Ansgar and Moody here. In fact, Ansgar, why don't you tell me what it is? And then uh, Moody here, why don't you tell me why you would use it? 
Uh, so for snapshot testing, the what is um, kind of defined in <laughs> how it works. And uh, so um, we've seen a test case before uh, where we're checking whether um, certain thing equals the value that we then have to put in here, which works if it's quite small, uh, but it gets more complicated if you're checking uh, deeper objects. And it gets even worse when you're checking um, different large chunks of text even. Um, so for snapshot tests, um, you won't write that, but the test will kind of um, encounter the value the first time it runs. And then it will put it jest, which is the test runner we're using for TypeScript, and will put that value there. And a different term that I've recently learned that this goes under, I think is also called like golden testing, where you have an expected output, um, which is a larger amount of text. Um, and um, kind of compare that. Um, although I don't know whether, whether golden tests are like created automatically, which is really the power of snapshot tests, um, or whether you have to write them on your own in the first place. All right, and then tell me the value of it here. I'm mean, here. What yes. and specifically what's going to differentiate it from the other two, as well. Yeah, so if you look at what is on the screen right now, like line 34 to 40, you will see that we we did a couple of things here and said like, oh, there's this JSON, make sure that it has a property that has this name, and then it returns an object that contains this thing, and then that has an attribute that has a string that has this specific thing, right? And this is really valuable here because you don't know the task ID, but if you're dealing with a lot of static data where you like, um, uh, that we'll we'll touch on is like oh you have a policy that you don't want to change uh, and or you're dealing with like some kind of like input that you should not be touching at all and if something happens to that one you want to know that you broke something like that would be the scenario there so in that case snapshot testing provides you really easy and then also super fast like it's a super lazy way of doing these things of like I will without really having uh, to write down everything specific or copy paste from somewhere. I'll just create this test. I'll leave it empty, just runs once. And then if the function itself is empty, for example, it'll fill it up for you. It's really nice. And then it just, um, um, and once you run it the next time, so that's like kind of set in stone then. And if you run it again, it will fail if the output does not change or the test uh, uh, generates this output, which is different from that. And then you will obviously know that whatever you thought was static is no longer uh, that way. So you, you have then the option of like saying, oh, that was right. I want to change it. So you go and say, update the snapshot. No problem. Jess will do it for you. You don't have to do it manually at any point. Uh, or you're like, oh, this is wrong. I wanted the same output. So I'm, there's definitely something wrong in, in the way that I've uh, changed the code. Um, so that's kind of where snapshot testing is really, really valuable. It's not applicable any, everywhere. Like we see here, it, snapshot testing would not work because the IDs generated will be different each time. But for some, some things that we'll show right now, it's really valuable and it's really fast to do. Yeah, one thing to add to that is that for this example, we also, we are fine that there are other properties in the object. So this resource has different config that we don't care whether it changes. Whereas for snapshots, we um, are not allowed anything to change, which is also a reason for when you should not use snapshot tests, because we could say, well, we'll call it the day um, after uh, putting our entire output into a snapshot, but then we would, we would essentially not be allowed to change anything anymore. And that's not the real reason you should have tests, because if they just lock your code in place, you might as well stop working on the code. So um, Daniel a, Schmidt. Another, what? <laughs> <laughs> just random call out to our engineer who, yeah, we're just blaming every, we're, we're using him as the bad practice engineer, even mm. though he's wonderful, but yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, great. So let's go ahead and get into the uh, into the, the the demo here. Yes. Um, so we do have one more snapshot test that I, of course, also prepared because, as I said, I'm a very slow typer. Um, and um, this look one is how short. small that is. Look at that. There we go. Nice. It, it's still, uh, or at this time, it still is. Um, so I, I imported the uh, policy document uh, because I kind of tell it that it is one, uh, so I can access its statement. 
um, which will come to event what that means. But what we are essentially doing is we are creating our stack and then we are trying to find where our task monitoring rule that we've heard about already is. And then we'll have a look into the monitoring permissions that it carries. And then we'll check what we kind of put into those. And in this case, um, uh, I haven't saved this file yet. And we have the uh, test watcher running. Um, so what this will do is if I now uh, save the file, um, I just wrote two match in nine snapshot and didn't put anything in there. But if I now save the file, um, the just notice file changes will run again. And then uh, as there was no input yet, it will uh, kind of accept this as, OK, this is fine. Whatever comes out of the uh, current statement input and then puts it here for us. So um, what we can see here now is that it actually included a snapshot of the value that's in statement um, or that we pass to statement. So in this case, this means there's an array um, with an object and that contains some actions that we are allowed to or that this um, policy is allowed to do. And then, um, yeah, we don't have any resources set there. So it's on any resource, it may list the clusters and so on. So, um, that's what snapshot tests kind of did for us. So I didn't have to write all of this on my own. Uh, and it now kind of controls whether there's any change to um, this value that we have at some can point. You, can you go break break the test for us? Yes, I, I like, like to break things. So yeah. um, what if uh, our monitoring rule um, that we have, the task monitoring rule, no need to uh, kind of find it, I think it's in the IM file, which has lots of things. Um, so our, oh, here it is. Looks close to what we just saw in the snapshot test. What if we now needed to add um, some new uh, thing to it? So if we need some more permissions, like, I don't know, describe log streams, for example. Uh, if I now save this file, um, I'll see that um, test run again, and they fail, and it tells us that um, there's a difference in the, in the snapshot. So um, actually, it received one more line that it didn't expect to. Uh, so this is how it fails now. Um, and with snapshots, there's the nice thing that we, we're like, yeah, well, we actually wanted to have that change. So with other tests, we would now need to go to the file, kind of change the test to, um, to have all of that in there. Whereas with snapshots, um, we can just um, press U for update. So press U character on my keyboard. And now they run again. Uh, but this time, we'll tell just to uh, update the snapshot. So it actually tells us that one change. Um, and if we look in the test again, uh, we can see um, that this now has uh, the logs one to it. So this is an example for our snapshots. I might also speed up uh, your intended changes. Of course, if lots of them are failing and you just press U and then uh, put in a new commit, uh, your coworkers would still need to have a look at those uh, change tests, but that's uh, what we do anyway. So um, we see that uh, what changed, whether it was actually intended to change. Um, but yeah, if you accidentally change something and there's uh, some locked value change, then we'll, we'll find that uh, with a very, Easily written test, I feel, um, because yeah, we yeah, mentioned it totally. before. This is one of this is the shortest of all of the ones that we have, except for the yeah. expected value. A couple of callouts here, just just so we're like the uh, everyone listening is sure. Um, to match a land snapshot is not a CDKTF thing. As you discussed before, it's just, right? So just because it picked up the permission and highlighted it does not mean it understands permissions at all. Like it's purely a output was different, this line was added kind of thing. So if you see like, oh, something is not kind of, it's not picking up the right thing, uh, it's probably, uh, don't assume it to be smarter than it is. It's basically just purely looking at the output and comparing it. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll leave it back to Cole to kind of forward back to me if I should be speaking more. But um... yes, <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> right. So this test I really like. Um, this is really really uh, interesting. So what we did in in line forty nine fifty one was like uh, we took our stack and we said like oh there's this role that we have, um, and that's the task monitoring role. 
uh, within that node, uh, within that role, we're uh, referencing this IAM policy document. And that one is called monitoring permissions, right? Um, and in that policy doc, uh, I want to make sure that we don't provide any extra permissions or we don't provide too few. Can right? you scroll down some Ansgar so the so the so they can see the test? Yeah. yeah. So for example, here we like, oh yeah, get, allow ECS list clusters, list con container instances, describe container instances, and something that answer tried to, try to sneak through. Uh, but it's going to be caught in pull request reviews and, and so on. So it won't go through anyway. But um, so here we have these uh, we have these things where um, we we've now really solidified that within our role we have um, these permissions, and that's not going anywhere. Um, and if you look through the history of the tests that we've written, we've systematically kind of like constrained how much the system can change over time. So for example, we now have a service that has the right role always. We've now made sure that the role has the right permissions always, right? So now as we go through these tests, it's getting harder and harder for somebody to make a mistake uh, moving forward. So they'll always know, oh, if I change the role, that's going to be caught in the test. If you change the policy, we get too much permissions or too few permissions, that's going to be caught. So, so this is kind of a really nice castigating effect of using all of these different types of tests uh, to constrain like how your in, uh, infrastructure should look like. Um, so I, I really love this test. I, I like if I was uh, when I was doing infrastructure before, if I had this kind of st stuff, it would save me like. Um, months <laughs> to kind of make track down where, where did I make a mistake all, again uh, on these like uh, hundreds of resources that I have and so on. Yeah, that was a great, that was a great summary of the value that this one file is providing uh, across the project. Really good way to, to, to put it. Um, so I, just from, from like also my, my sort of DevOps experience, this is also just sort of like summarize the whole thing here. Just because your 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 suite does may not have Jess, because we've had some people. We had one person ask if we could see uh, examples in Python. I do want to drive home that the test that that they've created in this last case for snapshot testing, you could do as a unit test. You could also do it as one of the integration tests if you wanted to. The big the big win for this snapshot test, if you're in TypeScript, is what it was originally put together for, and that was to make it faster and more convenient, so you're spending less time uh, testing, which when you have when you spend less time testing, setting up compliance, setting up all these other things, obviously you can do more of it with less overhead. But for those of you who are in TypeScript, this is how I sort of came to, to sort of think about stuff. And obviously this is this is how Everett wants to go. But for snapshot testing, basically you're taking a snapshot of your code's world and just making sure it don't change. It doesn't. And if it does, you see exactly that, right? Not only that, you can take the snapshot of this world. And then say, hey, the snapshot should look like this specifically. And if anything does change, you can throw an error. And this is, you could say, well, how is this different from unit testing? That's actually very similar, except in unit testing, you're setting up that snapshot of the world manually. You're grabbing the specific resources and you're testing a specific value. So as to where these different things fit, the funny thing is, is even though we've tagged compliance with unit tests and we've tagged resource relationships with integration testing and safeguarding here with snapshot testing, the reality is, is how these tests can be used and where they can be used for what specific logic, that's going to be largely a decision your team makes because obviously they all have their own place in the different areas of things that you want to do. Um, but regardless of how you use them, the way uh, Moody here summed it up there was beautiful. However you use them, the end of this, you have got a ton more uh, in terms of all of these different value adds for the rest of your code in terms of safeguarding uh, a lot against a lot of different things. Okay. Any, was anything I said there egregiously incorrect? Uh, the two of you, please correct me if at any point you're like, oh, that water is definitely not dry. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> That's, oh no, I was about to say that's dry ice, but that's not made out of oh, water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> see, it's not see, made out of water. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. And then just for everyone who is curious, uh, we have been saying Jest, J-E-S-T. That is the name of that, that uh, snap, the, the snapshot testing uh, framework that they are using. Okay, so I know we're going a little bit over time, but hey, this is testing and something people have really wanted to see. Um, that was the third form of, uh, that was the, the third type of uh, testing here. So 
let's uh, let's sum it up here, right, y'all? So unit testing, what is it in a nutshell here and for what? To test small individual components in isolation. Mm, yes, and then Muda here, tell me what integration testing is and, and as opposed to unit testing. Yeah, so here's where you test all your relationships. Make sure that everything is kind of wired up right and your overall system kind of looks okay when you when you make changes to it. Right, and then snapshot testing, we'll just ping back to, to Ansgar here, make you work double. Yeah, this in theory can be applied on both layers. So snapshot tests don't care whether they're for unit or integration, but they're for the lazy developer if you want, so my favorite. Um, and um, yeah, use them if you want to um, save time while testing and uh, like capture an entire thing, basically. And add, just to add a star to it, like all good engineers are lazy engineers. So yes, it, this is for everyone. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is that's more or less what we wanted to show today. We're gonna have the links to this demo code uh, up for you. I'll have that under the uh, just the video description. Um, we've had some people ask this will be live after the fact. Uh, so afterwards, you know, it'll go. Um, up on YouTube immediately. It'll take a little bit for it to, to get the chapter markers to the different sections, um, but those will be there. Um, and obviously, uh, check out the CDK for Terraform GitHub repo. I'll just go ahead and post that in the chat here, uh, which well, I'm going to put that here. You should see that come out from our main account here across. Well, it did not go to LinkedIn, so I will post it manually in LinkedIn here. Uh, that's where you can go to, to keep, keep track of all of the, uh, the change logs, open up an issue and make sure if you open up an issue, you call out Daniel Schmidt, uh, specifically, <laughs> I'm just giving, um, yeah, um, call out, call out one of these two, call it anybody, call don't call me out though, um, where you can leave feedback, uh, or, or contribute to, to feedback or even help, uh, perhaps get involved with it. And then also we have the, uh, documentation, maybe you should have ch uh, checked that out as well. And I'm going to point to the CDK for Terraform uh, tutorials that we have. And so I'm going to drop a link in there. You can go and check those out. They are um, nearly all of them, if not all of them, are set up to where you can follow along in any language of your choosing. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Are we missing any other calls to action that you would like to put out there? other than saving the world or something like that. <laughs> just just that, test your code. Always test your code. Yeah. I was waiting for one more shout out to our amazing colleague, Daniel. So, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, great. Uh, I think that's all that wraps up what we had today. Uh, just um, obviously check out those links, leave feedback. And if you're interested, check out our developer.hashicorp.com uh, platform where we've got a number of tutorials uh, to do so. If you have any other questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us on social, direct through our GitHub. We also have our discuss.hashicorp.com platform as well. And uh, until next time. <laughs>